on behalf of Health for the World, good morning to everyone that has joined for today's radiology grant rounds titled Overview of Radiology and Imaging Modalities with a Focus on Imaging of the Abdomen and Pelvis in Trauma. And our guest speaker today is Dr. Michael Larson. Dr. Larson is an assistant professor in radiology at the University of California in Davis in Sacramento. Um, Dr. Larson completed his medical degree and PhD in a joint uh, MD-PhD program at the University of Wisconsin, and then continued his radiology residency and abdominal imaging fellowship at University of Arizona in Tucson. Uh, Dr. Larson also serves as an advisor for imaging for medical imaging um, for a medical imaging company and is interested in research fields of biophysics and minimally invasive interventional radiology. Without further ado, uh, Dr. Larson, please take it away. All right, thank you. And uh, thanks for anyone listening and thank you for your time. Uh, big thanks to Health for the World to help educate anyone with internet access, which is awesome. I'm invested in education locally and I'm grateful for the chance to do a little bit more especially since my kids still guilt trip me for, for leaving them to go to the hospital. Um, so it'd, hard, it'd be hard to leave California physically and to, to go and teach as much as I would enjoy it. I was originally gonna give this talk at the beginning of the year, but as with many things, COVID kind of delayed this. Um, it was gonna be a kind of an overview for any new radiologists or, or a refresher for not so new radiologists. So today I'm gonna to skim the surface of radiology rather than go into a, a, a deep dive in a single subject for details I'll kind of explain later. So here are my, here are my disclosures. And then before George Lucas credits were always at the beginning. So I wanna um, again, thank Health for the World, Dr. Kayla Court for pointing out Health for the World um, and, and the great resources that it, it was. Uh, I want to thank Courtney Williams, founder of uh, Imagine Solutions Technology for the inspiration and the desire to get ultrasound to the world. And then biggest thanks of all to Dr. Baron Schmidt uh, for his inspiration through uh, the Haiti Radiology Development Corporation, or he likes to call it hardcore, um, kind of pictured here, uh, bringing radiology to the world. So a patient asked a doctor seemingly simple question. Can you do anything for my cough? And treating a cough, it depends. Is it a post-nasal drip from an upper, upper respiratory tract infection? Is it, a, is it gastroesophageal reflux disease? Is it pneumonia? Is it a pulmonary embolism? So a diagnosis is critical in, uh, because a symptom is not a diagnosis and, and diagnosticians have a critical role because any treatment should be based on a reasonable diagnosis. So again, brief overview of radiologist tools is we're the main diagnosticians in modern medicine uh, and kind of focus on abdominal pelvic trauma because trauma is a global disease burden in a broad sense that it's the premature cause of death in over 5 million people worldwide annually, unfortunately. But having an accurate diagnosis of the traumatic injury is key in treatment. So Fundamentally, an image is a representation of something. So a medical imaging is using medically relevant representations, either to diagnose or guide therapy. And radiologists aren't the only type of doctors to use medical imaging, but we certainly better be the best at it. Um, I'm not gonna talk about optical imaging or hybrid imaging um, that's not routinely done, but I hope that ad advances in optical imaging, which, uh, where we alter the property of, of light so, and so we can view it with our own eye. Um, I hope that those optical imaging techniques will hybrid, will make their way into radio, uh, you know, make the flow from emergency and ophthalmology uh, medicine to chromoendoscopy as used by, by gastroenterologists. I hope that that makes its way to, to radiology. Here's some interesting research, uh, an example of photoacoustic imaging where a laser is tuned to hit hemoglobin and can give these beautiful ultrasound images with a superimposed hemoglobin map. Um, but we're not there yet. Stay, just gonna, that's, uh, we'll get there eventually. But another fundamental of medical imaging is, is resolution or seeing things 
that are different as being different. And that can be either differences in space or differences in time or differences in uh, matter. So an example of spatial resolution issues is, is seeing a light in the distance on a road. Is it, is it a motorcycle? Is it just one headlight or is it a car and it's two headlights? Um, so this photo also has some poor temporal resolution because it, you know, it's not actually a picture of these floating curved white lines. It's actually just a car, but uh, the, the, the way we took the picture was the exposure was long enough that, that um, it ended up being these curved lines, right? But we can use artifacts to our advantage if, if we understand a little bit of physics. So in this next picture, if we, uh, if we knew how long it took to, to acquire that image and we knew the distance between these white lines, we could actually measure the speed of, of these cars uh, based on a single still image. Um, and then this is kind of, the last picture is kind of a, an issue of, of spectral resolution. All these cars kind of look different shades of gray and that's that's my it's, this is a, it's just actually from the poor spectral resolution from low light either from the camera that took this picture or, or our retinas in, in detecting it but a more textbook way radiologists and physicists measure spatial resolution in particular these line pairs per millimeter or how many lines you can cram into how many pairs of white and black lines you can cram into a space and still see it as as black and white lines as opposed to being kind of gray blobs. So that's resolution. Uh, contrast related to tissue or spectral resolution is the difference between similar um, in matter or similar in space or similar in time adjacent structures and contrast differs by imaging modality. Um, for example, on the on the right, there's an image of an MRI of a, this is all one patient. And you can kind of focus this, this upper MRI is an axial T2 weighted image. And um, I know that because the, the fluid is bright, whether it's the CSF fluid or in this case, the bile is really bright. And I see a bunch of little stones. This was a, a CT that they had soon after, um, different reason, but it's like the stones disappeared, right? We can't see the stones. Um, but then they also had an ultrasound where we could clearly see some uh, echogenic material shadowing. So it's not that they, the stones magically went away. It's just an uh, inherent limitation on the contrast between cholesterol stones and bile on the CT in that middle image. But with in contrast, we can, uh, intrinsic contrast limitations, we can overcome some of those limitations by giving the patient exogenous contrast. But then when we do that, we also worry or think about timing when we when we give contrast. So the bottom is uh, across the panel. This is a CT scan, axis CT scan through the abdomen uh, without any contrast. Then I can just glance. I know this is this next one is an arterial phase where the technologist gave a bolus of contrast and then took the pictures and and so we could see how the arteries look. Next is a portal venous phase. The, the portal veins kind of bright right here. And then this next one is after the contrast is floated around in equilibrated or equilibrium phase. So a radiologist needs to understand the physiology and anatomy behind contrast administration. Um, since there's also an important thing about uh, route, which I'll get into, or route or route of administration I'll get into. Um, but, you know, if it took three minutes to acquire a single CT slice like it did in the 70s, it, uh, then you know, that would be, that would uh, be an issue with spatial or temporal resolution. So we had to think about these things. Uh, and then we also have to think about route of administration that needs to be considered that we'll get into. Uh, but before that, the last and key ingredient of the medical imaging process is the doctor that will use that information. Because after the images are there, someone needs to be able to read and interpret or understand them. Um, I was once asked by a surgery resident if there was an article or a short book that would teach them how to read CTs. And at first I was offended and wanted to ask them if there was an article or a short book that uh, would, would teach me how to do surgery, but I didn't, you know, I was, I was professional and, and just told them, no, I don't, I don't know. Um, but then that, that day I went home and my daughter was learning to read and she was putting together sounds, but she, 
and she was doing it correctly, but she didn't have a clue what the words actually meant. So think of this lecture as kind of a whirlwind tour of, of how to read, but not necessarily how to interpret studies related to abdominal trauma, because interpreting them is, is why we have a residency. Um, and then you also now have a link to, sur to send any surgery residents that ask you if there's a, a resource on how to learn to read CTs um, in an hour. So, but then there's a difference in being able to read and to understand. So for example, I can, I can read this to you. It says makudo narudo, which is hard for, for most native English speakers don't understand what that means. But if you know a little bit, um, it's actually Japanese for McDonald's. Um, and you can actually read, a lot of people can read and understand the symbol right away, right? Even if it's upside down, sideways. Um, so if you understand things, uh, if you understand the image, you can get a meaning from it. And um, so reading is just the beginning of interpreting and understanding. So uh, as a resident, I had the great opportunity to hear um, from Dr. Lee Rogers. He was the editor of um, AJR for, for a long time. And he would always say, the eye can only see what the mind knows. So um, you might see something, you might be able to put words together, but you don't know what it means. Um, just like, you know, my daughter could put words together and didn't know what it, it, it meant. Um, so, Jumping in, the first uh, imaging modality is x-rays, which were discovered by Wilhelm Röntgen in, in 1895, and medical uses were immediately obvious. Modern x-rays have a, a cathode that sheds electrons. Oh, sorry, let me come over here. Modern x-rays have a, a cathode that sheds electrons like a cat sheds fur through a process called thermionic emission. And then those electrons are attracted to uh, the metal anode that has a, a kilovolt charge on it, a uh, positive charge to attract those electrons. And then those flying electrons then lose, lose kinetic energy in the form of REM strolone or breaking radiation um, or characteristic peaks when they knock uh, atom, electrons out of, out of the atoms and then the other electrons fall and fill those holes. That lost kinetic energy has to be accounted for by law as in the first law of thermodynamics, and is, it's injected in the form of photons, some of which have high enough energy to make it past filters and onto the patient, and eventually through the patient onto a screen for us to read. Um, there's a lot of electronics and stuff that goes into that, and generally in the United States, we have the setup so that whatever is absorbing more x-rays is brighter or denser, and then whatever is absorbing less is dark or lucent or see-through for these, these static images. Um, but the reverse may or may not be true for dynamic or fluoroscopic images. And then um, I'm, I'm told in, in other places in Europe or Germany in particular, you know, this is more the, the standard is to whatever's more absorbent is darker, which makes more sense intuitively uh, in teaching physics, but I, I can't change traditions like that. So. Um, and then Godfrey Hounsfield, he uh, was employed by EMI, which also signed the Beatles band. Uh, he took x-rays to another level and invented CT. And, um, you know, there's many more details can be found elsewhere, including uh, Health for the World Academy lectures on, on radiation and uh, physics and safety. So contrast for radiographs or live radio radiography or fluoroscopy uh, are based primarily on three flavors to increase that, the differentiation of tissue types um, intrinsic. So the first flavor of exogenous contrast is iodine. Um, and the most, it's the most common given positive contrast agent. It, there are some drawbacks, including allergies, which occur on, uh, on the order of one in a hundred people, though the severe allergies are more on the order of one in 200, one in 500 people. Another drawback is contrast-induced nephropathy. Um, for patients that have low kidney function, this can, uh, this iodine contrast given intravascularly can hurt the kidneys, but that's not if it's given directly into the bladder as, as in this is a coronal CT, 
um, cystogram where we've given contrast into the bladder to make sure there hasn't been any bladder rupture in a patient that had trauma. So contrast-induced nephropathy doesn't happen when we give contrast into the bladder nor when we, uh, or if we give it by mouth or if we give it by rectum or any other end of the, the GI tract as it's done here when we gave it through the biliary system. We don't get contrast-induced nephropathy when we inject it into the spinal canal uh, as was done or intrathecally as was done for the CT myelogram. And I'm not sure, you know, if we, we gave contrast transdermally, I don't even know if it's a possibility, but you get the point. It's only contrast-induced nephropathy only occurs when uh, iodine is given intravascularly. And then the, the last drawback with iodine is you can get a chemical pneumonitis if enough of it gets aspirated into the lungs. Barium is the next kind of flavor of uh, radio, uh, x-ray contrast, exogenous contrast we can give. It's much more inert than iodine with allergy incidence on the order of one in a thousand. So the drawback to barium though is uh, in a closed biological space, it can generate a uh, foreign body reaction or an inflammatory reaction and that can actually be fatal um, or, or not based on this very recent review of, uh, of in incidental barium leaks that uh, uh, were treated with vi vigorous peritoneal lavage. But there are plenty of case reports where um, the barium leaking caused such inflammation that it, that it ended up being fatal. So um, that is one drawback. Um, and really, barium should not be given if there's suspicion of gastrointestinal perforation, toxic megacolon, or a recent gastrointestinal biopsy, um, recent as in like 10 to 14 days before that. Um, but barium is pretty inert. It actually used to be uh, inhaled uh, for barium sulfate bronchography. So pa patients can aspirate that with, without major issue. There's a report of a complication of barium that had hung around for years in this patient that had, had a barium uh, bronchography. And that was, all, was primarily only done before CT to evaluate bronchi and bronchioles. And then you don't have to worry if, if there's concern for uh, perforation and you don't see one with water soluble um, iodine, you can always give barium sulfate. Again, this was an article by uh, Dr. Rogers group, um, Dr. Lee Rogers showing, showing that. So those are the iodine and barium are two positive contrasts where they absorb more x-rays than adjacent gas is a negative contrast. And unlike the other two, it absorbs less. The benefit of using gas is there's no allergies to room air or medical grade CO2 or carbon dioxide in the, in the case of CO2 and geography. The drawback is it can't be given intraarterially or intravenously if there's any possibility of a, of a right to left shunt due to the risk of air embolism. And the contrast, it's, it's not as uh, strong, not as great as, as the positive contrast agents we have. But another benefit of room air is it's free. So I've, I've told some of the surgery residents to put 20 mLs of room air into a feeding tube right before they take a radiograph um, if they don't want to wait for iodine uh, and they want to make sure that the feeding tube is in the intestines and, and not in the stomach. So uh, on the left is actually what used to be done uh, to image the lateral ventricles before CT. And this is called pneumoencephalography where they use that negative contrast and, and gas, and they just inject a bunch of gas into the CSF space to, to see where it went. Thankfully, we have CT because um, much less invasive. And then on the right is uh, air enema, actually. You can kind of see this, this pediatric patient has uh, ileocolonic intussusception where the colon or the uh, small bowel is intussuscepting into the large bowel. And so they'll, they'll push enough air in so we can watch that intussusception reduce in real time. So gas can be a good contrast agent in certain situations. Nuclear air medicine was kind of the next, but I'm, I don't, I'm not going to be able to cover that because it has way too many contrast agents and scan types since each radio tracer will resolve different tissue types depending on the radio pharmaceutical. Um, but one example relevant to trauma, not necessarily in the acute phase, but more of the subacute phase is the hepatobiliary aminodiacetic acid or the HIDA scan. And in this case, we used 99M technetium 
99 technetium 99m mebrofenin, uh, which is excreted into the bile. And uh, this is patient, this is a coronal on the left is a coronal CT showing um, liver laceration essentially. And the, this patient ended up having a fluid flexion that that didn't really resolve. So we we're wondering is it is it hematoma? Is it a bioloma or a bile leak? And so they got the HIDA scan and confirmed bile leak. But so that not as applicable to, to the acute phase of trauma, but still nuclear medicine is awesome. Um, piezo or piezoelectric crystals were characterized by Pierre Curie and are the basis for ultrasound. And the key element, whether it's a piezoelectric crystal as most of most people have or capacitive uh, micromachined ultrasonic transducers or CMUTs as it's kind of a new technology, does the same thing. This, this key element uh, in the ultrasound will vibrate in response to alternating currents and send out sound waves. These elements then emit electricity as they get vibrated while they listen for a returning echo. And then the time between that echo corresponds to the depth and then the strength of that echo uh, corresponds to the brightness. So bright things in ultrasound uh, or, or as we like to say, echogenic or hyperechoic things on ultrasound are strong interfaces. Like um, the image on the right is a fetal ultrasound scan. You can kind of see the bone. The frontal bone is, is pretty bright because of that strong interface. Um, you can see some maternal fat closer to the, the top of the screen. It can, be, it can be bright, but then fluid or, is a great conductor of sound. Like in this case, water or amniotic fluid is black what we call anechoic or very hypoechoic. Um, and then kind of muscle is isoechoic, kind of in the middle. It's it's all relative, so you can actually say that um, the muscle is hypoechoic to bone or, or fat. So, um, And then with contrast with ultrasound, the agents are, are microbubbles. They're fossil lipid bubbles, uh, phospholipids that are in case of gas. Um, and they pretty much stay in the vasculature when given IV since their size is between one to seven microns, and generally one to seven micrometers in diameter. So they, they pretty much just stay in the, um, in the vasculature. Their phospholipid shell is metabolized by the, the liver and then the, the gas is exhaled after a few minutes um, after being given. And these microbubbles can be given through the bladder, or through the uterus to assess fallopian tubes in certain countries, but we're pretty much limited here in the United States to, to echocardiograms and characterizing abdominal masses. So this image is of what we thought was a complex renal cyst, but then when we gave the ultrasound contrast on the, on the right, um, we see that bright area that shows that the, where the contrast is getting, meaning this is a vascular lesion. And um, you know, giving microbubbles in the setting of trauma may uh, may, be, may be useful in certain places, but um, we'll get to CT soon. And uh, MRI is kind of the last imaging modality. Rizzoli isn't applicable in most cases to trauma, but it is incredibly useful due to an inherent soft tissue contrast. Basically with MRI, we align some hydrogens in the body using very powerful magnet. We then hit those hydrogens with radio waves and the hydrogens bounce back in, they're in the, when they're remagnetized in that powerful magnetic field. And basically we just detect the bounce back with the electromagnetic waves and, and make an image. And this example um, shows three CT, coronal CT images. So we have a non-contrast on the upper left, uh, arterial phase on the upper right, and then a kind of a venous phase on the lower left um, to look at this inferior pole um, right inferior pole lesion, which looks like, you know, there could be some something else besides just a, a simple cyst. And then on this MRI on the bottom right, it's a venous phase coronal MRI. And it's very easy to see the cystic neoplasm because of the inherent uh, soft tissue resolu resolution. So um, contrast agents for MRI include gadolinium-based or iron-based agents. Um, and that's kind of beyond the scope of this lecture, but here's just a quick example of uh, iron-based contrast is done on transplant kidneys here at UC Davis. Um, this is the image on the left is the MR 
angiography on a transplant kidney using um, this iron-based contrast agent. Actually, it's iron-based. Uh, it's iron given to patients who have anemia of chronic disease, typically. So it's, it's actually given often to patients who have uh, chronic, chronic renal disease. Um, and then a corresponding uh, angiogram showing that, that area of stenosis or narrowing. Um, so in summary, contrast is an important topic in medical imaging, whether it's intrinsic contrast or, or exogenous to given contrast. And I encourage you to learn more at the Health for the World's website. They have a good um, lecture there. So kind of moving on to trauma, why trauma? Like any disease, radiologists play a critical role in diagnosing and staging the, the disease that trauma is. And if you haven't thought about trauma as a disease, here's uh, a list of academies that, that think it is, if you want to read more. But radiologist's role um, in, in a trauma patient should begin as soon as the patient gets to the hospital. Um, and I'll refer you to a, a chest radiology or chest imaging section of the Health for the World to go over a chest radiograph search pattern because chest and pelvic x-rays are standard for patients that have experienced substantial torso trauma. Um, but yeah, every patient that has experienced trauma should be at a screening chest and pelvic radiograph. And I am going to go over a uh, pelvic radiograph uh, search pattern. And this is very typical of what we get in a, in a high speed MVC or motor, motor vehicle collision or, or substantial trauma. Um, you know, there's lots of, lots of things overlapping. It's hard to tell what is going on, but that's sometimes what, what, what we have to work with. Uh, so I like to start at the top and compare side to side, looking at the iliacs for something called a Duverney or isolated iliac fracture, or look at the sciatic notch, uh, make sure that there's no fracture going there, or even more medially, make sure there's not a fracture involving the SI joint or fracture involving the sacrum, whether it's vertically through one of these uh, sacral zones, one, which are lateral to the the frame, the sacral foramen, two involves the sacral foramen, or three involves the vertebral, the sacral vertebral body. Um, so I'm comparing side to sides, then I'm coming down uh, along the iliopectineal line, which uh, goes from uh, ilium down to the pubic synthesis, uh, making sure there's no step offs or, or bumps in that. Um, and we can kind of clearly see on this one, there is a step off between the right iliopectineal line and the left. So this patient definitely had uh, pubic synthesis dissociation. Then there's also the ilioischial line to follow um, down into the obturator rings. Make sure there's no step offs there. Last is Shenton's line, looking at uh, making sure there's not a displaced or uh, subluxed or dislocated femur. And then I'm also looking at the, the femur neck. So there's... Uh, how to read a pelvic radiograph in a, in a in a minute, but how to interpret it is a, is a different thing, right? Um, so that's where radio radiographs can, can be very helpful. Um, and then uh, beyond radiographs, it used to be common for exploratory laparotomy or diagnostic peritoneal lavage in patients that had abdominal trauma. So DPL or diagnostic peritoneal lavage is where pa patients got basically stabbed with a needle and they put a, a liter of saline into the abdomen and then washed out and uh, saw how much blood they could get out. And uh, if there was a lot of blood, they knew that they needed to go to surgery or if not, then they, you know, they're, they're more stable. But thankfully, um, the focused assessment with sonography and trauma actually started off the focused abdominal uh, sonography exam and trauma but it kind of changed to be the focus assessment with sonography and trauma or FAST exam became common over the past three or four decades and has replaced this uh, diagnostic peritoneal lavage and minimized how many x laps or exploratory laparotomies end up having to happen just to evaluate, just for the surgeon, just to look at the bowel. Um, so this is another piece of uh, literature that originated from UC Davis with the work of Dr. John McGann here. Um, and basically FAST, it used to just replace the, the diagnostic peritoneal lavage, but it's kind of been uh, incorporated into uh, trauma algorithms on how to treat these patients. So 
you can kind of see the flow chart. The way Idelius uses a uh, patient has abdominal trauma, they're unstable, they get right to the resuscitation bay and they have a fast exam. And then depending on if they have free peritoneal fluid, they go straight to the operating room, no more imaging. Um, the somewhat uh, stable patients, you know, they might have a fast exam that's positive and, and then get a CT or if they're unstable, uh, but not unstable enough where the surgeons want to take them right away to, to an operating room, then they, they, they get funneled to a CT. Or if they are stable and they have a negative fast exam, sometimes that's, that's good enough. Uh, or you can repeat the fast exam or, or depending on the clinical picture, go on to, to different imaging modalities or, or observation. And this is kind of how to perform the fast exam in a nutshell. I actually taught this to some uh, paramedics and uh, had to tweak my, my slides a little bit, but part of the, uh, of the fast exam is to look um, right, right upper quadrant or hepatal renal space, also called Morrison's pouch. And why we look there is because fluid would accumulate there in the supine patient. Um, if you're to fill the abdomen, abdominal pelvic cavity with fluid, a lot of it would, would uh, pool in, in that Morrison's pouch there. Um, and then after you look at the hepatorenal space, oh, so one thing that uh, helped me was to understand the anatomy better was to correlate what I'm seeing on CT or in textbooks with what I'm seeing on ultrasound because many uh, beginning uh, medical students, radiology residents, you know, ultrasound just looks like a bunch of black blobs if you're not oriented. And so um, this is actually... The, the text picture on the left would not be a, a negative fast exam because there's too much space between the dif uh, between the liver and the kidney there, but kind of corresponds to the, where we're looking corresponds to the negative fast exam, Morrison's pouch on the right. So that's what a negative fast exam can look like. And there's some of the anatomy labeled for it helps, if it helps. And then I hope you guys are seeing this video as well um, of a negative fast exam. Cine clip. So that's part A, and then here's a here's a positive fast exam where you can kind of see a sliver of, of anechoic, which means it's fluid between the, the kidney and, and liver there. And then here it is in real time watching it. And it and that that line can be pretty subtle sometimes. So the next part of the fast exam is the sub fluid view or cardiac view or heart window. Um, and and Basically, you have the transducer sub xiphoid and are just trying to peek at the heart or around the heart, essentially. And notice the liver is going to be in the field of view. And so sure enough, when we, we see an actual, actual negative pericardial fast exam, you can see a little bit of, of liver up top. And then the, the blood, which is anechoic or, yeah, anechoic, um, you can see that there. And then this is uh, negative fast exam, you can just see the heart beating and not much anechoic uh, or, or blood around it. And then this is uh, unfortunately a positive uh, pericardial fast exam where the, the authors have put a little stars around that uh, the pericardial fluid. Um, and then this is the cine clip of, of a pericardial fusion in real time. The next portion is the spinal renal space or the left upper quadrant should basically mirror the hepatal renal space space, uh, but sometimes you have to go really posterior because the spleen's really far back. Um, and, you know, if the patients can hold their breath to bring their diaphragm down, that's, that's ideal, but sometimes they can't. And then uh, this is an example of negative spinal renal space with labels, of course. It'd be nice if the, the labels came on our ultrasound images, but they don't. And then again, um, this is, this thing is not working. Um, and then this is an example of actually a, a tricky thing. If you, if, the, if you are solely focused on looking at the interface between the kidney and spleen, you'd miss the uh, fluid around the fluid actually around the, the spleen. And if you were to shift the patient, uh, you might have the, the spleen float off the, the kidney there. Um, and then this is an example of uh, spinal renal space that's positive for fluid. So that would be a, a, po a positive, positive fast exam. And then last is the pelvis, um, scanning deep in the pelvis, the recto vesicular space in men or recto uterine space or Patrick Douglas um, in women. 
And it's a little, sometimes can be a little more tricky. You can do the transverse ax, transverse or axial scanning. Um, so this is kind of just on the left is a CT, axial CT showing kind of the plane of the ultrasound. And then uh, the middle image is a sagittal CT showing kind of how the probe would be flat. And we'd be looking at it like that. Um, and then if you were to rotate the probe 90 degrees, it would give you a longitudinal or sagittal view of the pelvis. And it's gonna give two different images, whether this is the, the, the axial or transverse running through the bladder. And then here's the same, just running trans, uh, longitudinal, sagittally. And then this is kind of negative fast exams in the pelvis in, in a male, and then negative in a female. And then here's an example of a positive um, pelvic portion of the FAST exam where you can see the bladder is the round structure and then you can see the sharp black or anechoic spaces indicating free fluid. Um, and then this is the same thing kind of in the, the transverse plane as opposed to the sagittal plane. So that's a, a summary of the FAST exam the focus assessment with sonography and trauma, and it really can help clinical uh, decisions in patients with substantial trauma. And so kind of the last modality I'm gonna go over is CT. And before we, we get a CT, you gotta think about, you know, are we gonna give contrast IV? Are we, what, what's the timing? We're gonna give contrast, are we gonna give oral contrast? What's the timing? Um, you know, after we've thought about this and acquired the CT images, next, the radiologist, since we're, we're key in, in making decisions, you know, interpreting these images, reading and interpreting, um, you gotta have a search pattern or a methodical way to evaluate organ systems or, or regions rather than just kind of an endless scrolling as many of us are expert at uh, thanks to social media and, and the like. So I had a neuroradiologist joke that the viscera were just secretion and feces forming organs. And I thought it was kind of funny but then uh, when I was coming up with a, a search pattern, I thought it was appropriate that splat, which is kind of the, the noise or the onomatopoeia, the noise from fluids from said organs, uh, splat's the acronym or the mnemonic I use to diligently search out pathology in the abdomen or pelvis. And so when I'm running, a, um, oh, and before I get to my search pattern, I also have to touch on absorption and windowing, which this hopefully for radiologists is, is a second nature, but for, for newer radiologists, um, windowing or absorption is based on the fact that uh, on in calibrated CT scanners, um, we have these Hounsfield units based off of Godfrey Hounsfield, the inventor of CT, where negative 1,000 Hounsfield units will be no x-ray absorption and zero Hounsfield units will be pure water absorption. And then biological specimens or biological samples um, are variable with kind of ranges listed just, just as, a, as a ballpark. And so windowing is a way to really bring out the difference in contrast in the organs. And um, so for example, the bar on the, on the left um, corresponds kind of to a long window where in, in the upper left corner uh, image where I can really see the, the lung, but I can't, you know, I can't see much difference between fat and muscle. But then going over to the upper right image, that's uh, more of an abdomen window where I can see the differences between fat and muscle and spleen, kidney, or spleen, heart, liver. And then if I were to give contrast, I'd want an angiogram window so I can kind of see through the, the, the contrast or see around the contrast in the bottom left corner. And then bottom right corner is kind of like a bone window where that we're really just focusing high, really high up on the Hounsfield unit scale so that we can see the differences between cortical bone and, and trabecular or cancellous bone. So that's kind of windowing in a nutshell. So my first step in looking at the abdomen is actually to, to run a mini uh, lower, uh, mini chest surge pattern, which my search pattern for the, for the chest is look at the lungs on, on the lung or gas window and look at the heart and pulmonary vasculature on the angio window or the abdomen window, depending on um, if we give contrast or not. And I'm showing you kind of a, a non-contrast in the upper left-hand corner and then arterial uh, venous and a delayed phase of contrast. So the uh, arterial is kind of upper right, venous is uh, bottom left, and then the delayed is on the right. Just not that, not that we get these on every trauma patient, but this is just as an example. Um, standard uh, 
standard here um, is to just obtain the portal venous phase, so kind of the bottom left in, in patients with trauma, but depending on what we saw in our pelvic x-ray or the, or the FAST exam, we might want to give, uh, we might be worried about an arterial injury, in which case we'd, give, we'd do an arteriogram and or a portal venous uh, exam. So the first, the S for me is, is spleen, and a normal spleen will not have a normal appearance to the untrained eye and, and has been called a psychedelic in appearance or zebra stripe or tigroid and um, on the arterial phase in the upper right hand corner. In the setting of trauma, blood clot and spleen can look very similar density on the non contrast, which is why it's standard to give IV contrast, um, even, even without worrying about contrast induced nephr nephropathy if the patient's at risk from, from morbidity or mortality from their traumatic injury. Um, you know, we don't worry about contrast induced nephropathy and just give contrast anyways. Um, and so typically we're looking in the bottom left-hand corner at a kind of a, a portal venous phase or venous phase um, to see if we can see any areas of non-enhancement, uh, which would suggest laceration or, or ischemia or, you know, this is why you need a, a radiology residency. And I can't just tell you what to, what to each little uh, abnormality means. The P in splat, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, the P is pancreas. And as young trainee, I often struggle to find the pancreas. But if you find the spleen, you've found the splenic vasculature, you've found the, the pancreas. The pancreas has a good blood supply and should enhance homogeneously on, uh, on arterial phase. And often you can see the, the main pancreatic duct as, as you can kind of see a sliver of um, slightly hypodense line in the, in the middle of the, the pancreas on the bottom left and bottom right image. And with pancreatic trauma, we're looking for edema or hemorrhage around the, around it. I'm sorry, I have a typo here. Uh, edema or hemorrhage around the pancreas will manifest as, as a stranding and non-enhancing areas are concerning for a laceration or a contusion. And then ductal injuries where that main pancreatic duct is involved can be subtle, but really important to diagnose because that will drastically, uh, you know, uh, pancreatic ductal injuries is going to be a lot worse for the patient. L, I'm looking at the liver, including evaluation of the biliary parenchyma, um, the blood and bile tracts. And we pay attention to any clefts or areas of non-enhancement that would suggest a laceration or, or um, and kind of similar to the spleen. Also with the spleen, small areas of perivascular blood clot can look very much like the liver. So that's why it's standard just to give contrast. Um, so we can see like, as, as we do in the bottom left, a uh, good portal venous phase. Uh, the A is black. I'm looking at the adrenals and you can't, can't uh, separate them from the renals or kidneys. And so the adrenals are inverted D or Y shaped anteromedial and superior to the kidneys. Sometimes it can be pretty hard to see in, in uh, patients without a lot of fat. Um, and then the kidney evaluation, I'm looking at the cortex, medullary sinus fat and collecting system, perinephric fat, just looking for any uh, clefts of non-enhancement or you know, they could be lacerations, but then there's also fetal lobulations or cysts or scarring that can alter the renal contour as well. Next, a lot of T's. I'm looking at the GU tract. I follow the kidneys. Uh, since I'm out of the kidneys, I follow the ureters down as best I can uh, to evaluate the, the um, urinary bladder. And, and then I'm looking at the prostate, some of the vesicles, and any, uh, anything I can see in the testicles, penis, in men or, or uterus, ovaries, vulva in women, make sure there's no uh, stranding or, or injuries there. And then if, if there is concern based on our pelvic radiographs for a urinary tract uh, injury, sometimes we'll right then and there just have the patient wait five minutes and scan them again on the, um, in a delayed phase, looking at where the, the contrast is going in the ureters. And the next T is the GI tract. Since I'm, I'm down looking at the, the pelvis, I'll start from the rectum and work my way up, looking through the colon, and then uh, looking, starting up from the top, looking down from the lower esophagus through the stomach into the duodenum. And I'm paying attention to the caliber of bowel, wall enhancement, any stranding or abnormality in the, in the mesentery. Uh, and then the last. Uh, there's a few more T's. So when I'm done looking at the upper GI and I'm near the top, I start looking at the blood vessels from the top going down, ensuring there's not any dissection flap in, inside the blood vessels or intramural hematoma within, stranding around, um, 
areas of contrast extravasation or, or pseudoaneurysm. And this is where timing of contrast is especially critical in how sensitive and specific we are in diagnosing these uh, vascular injuries. And then I'm not quite there through, through my T's, uh, looking at soft tissue and muscles. And I basically am just looking all around the soft tissue for stranding to maybe point out, oh, you might've missed uh, uh, an entry along that, that path of, of, of trauma or, or whatnot. So I'm looking for symmetry in the muscles, looking for any herniations, including herniating uh, diaphragm. And then the last T um, is the neurotube, AKA spine, AKA bones. I'm looking at all of the, the, protect, the, the protective neurotube as well as the, the spinal cord itself. Um, you know, in addition to evaluating bones in the axial, uh, plain on bone window. I also have the benefit of having coronal and sagittal reformats on all trauma cases. So I'll leave it to you to find a more uh, detailed sub pattern to look at, uh, you know, to, to come up with ways to, to look at this. But that's basically my, uh, my acronym so that I can be diligent and methodical in looking at um, spleen, liver, adrenals, kidneys, GIGU tracts, uh, and then the neurotube, the spine. Um, Occasionally, if the trauma or other disease process is severe enough, I just sometimes will abandon my organ-based search pattern and just focus on a region, um, like reporting on the path of uh, a ballistic tract, for example, rather than jumping you between or you know, going from one organ system to another, um, just to just so I can keep my my search pattern. And then to avoid satisfaction of search, I like to say no additional abnormalities seen in the spleen or whatnot. So um, satisfaction of search is when you find something you're like, oh, great, I'm, I'm done, I'm awesome. And you move on and then you actually miss um, more subtle or, or more clinically important um, issues. So I'd encourage you to always say no additional abnormality once you find something so that you don't have satisfaction of search. So this concludes the whirlwind tour of imaging modalities for the younger diagnosticians out there uh, with a focus on abdominal pelvic trauma, uh, abdominal pelvic imaging in trauma. Uh, radiology is a wonderful, wonderfully diverse specialty using various medical imaging tools to diagnose and treat diseases. Uh, I want to reiterate the mind can only, that the eye can only see what the mind knows and um, medical imaging is, is critical in modern trauma care. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your time. Please feel free to email me with any ideas for improvements on this or, or collaborations or whatnot. And my, my email address is mclarson at ucdavis.edu. So thank you. Uh, Dr. Larson, thank you so much for this comprehensive uh, review of the imaging modalities and for sharing, obviously, your, your knowledge regarding abdominal trauma. I agree with you, the mind, the eye can only see what the mind knows. And there's another quote that I really enjoy uh, from a um, German philosopher, I think, that says something like, uh, you become what you understand. Once you <laughs> understand something and you are able to, you know, see it and, and, and interpret the finding, um, going back to the um, initial part of your talk. Um, I don't think we have uh, questions. Um, there's a message from Dr. Inverati saying thank you for the clear and informative uh, presentation. Uh, if someone has a question, please uh, you're, feel free to you know type them in the Q and A box. Otherwise, we can we can end this uh, fantastic lecture. Well, thanks. Yeah, and. And please email me with, uh, with any questions. If you want the, the slides to share with uh, colleagues, I'm happy to share them. Just, uh, um, or if you ever have a surgery resident asking if you, you know, is there a resource to teach me how to read CTs in an hour, you could, you could say that, yeah, you could read it, but whether you understand it, you know, interpret it, that's, that takes a four year story. residency. Like, <laughs> it's a different story. So, yep. Uh, so it seems like we don't have any questions, okay. Dr. Larson. Uh, once again, thank you so much for your time and for contributing to to the education to global health education.